Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy because it's Tuesday, so I get to hang out with you, my listeners, and that is always awesome. I appreciate you so much. I am excited to bring you another author interview. I hope your week is going well. I am excited because my hubby comes home today. I briefly mentioned the whole customer service fiasco a few weeks ago, or maybe not so briefly. I don't know how much I vented. I apologize. (laughs) But uh, he flew out to see his dad and his dad was not doing well. He's doing much better now, but he flew to Ohio to see his dad and he is coming home today. I will go pick him up from the airport in just a few hours. I'm very excited about that. So looking forward to having him home after three weeks, I think, away more than three weeks, but it's been a while and, uh, he's, he's coming home and, uh, two of our friends from California are flying in about an hour and a half after he lands. So it's our two friends and then the sister and brother-in-law of one of the friends. And so really looking forward to seeing them, meeting them for me. I have not met the sister and brother-in-law before. I've heard lots about them. So we'll have visitors. We have visitors from the UK. Our friends from Germany are here right now. Uh, the UK visitors have friends from Canada. <laughs> so we have lots of people to visit. It's, uh, it's a very international sort of it's going to be an international sort of couple of weeks going forward. Um, so looking forward to that. It should be fun. Lots, lots of visiting to do. And it's, it's a, probably a good thing that I've, that, that hubby's been gone and I've had massive amounts of introvert time in the last few weeks because I'm going to be extremely extroverted for the next two weeks. But I'm looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to having the hubby home. And I hope that your day is going to bring you something that you're looking forward to as well, whatever that might be. Maybe it's this interview. I would love that. As I mentioned last week, uh, another coincidence in the realm of podcast scheduling, book interview, author interview scheduling. Last week, talked to Robert Huffler about his book based on the movie The Way We Were, and then never done a, a interview with an author about a book based on a movie or written about a movie, and now I have two in a row. <laughs> So when I first, when this first was scheduled on my, on my calendar, I did not have the book yet. It was not ready. And so I contacted the publicist and said, this interview is coming up. Can you please send me the book? And they did. And it turns out that it is another book about a movie. This one is trivia about the movie Die Hard. And the movie is something that we, or the, the name of the book is something that we can't fully say because this is a PG podcast. Uh, we don't, I don't swear on the podcast much. Uh, occasionally drop some pretty minor swear words, I think, but those are pretty rare. And the name of this book is Yippie Kaye Mother Effer. <laughs> um, if you've seen Die Hard or any of the Die Hard movies, you know that line. If you've seen, even if you've never seen any of the Die Hard movies, I'm guessing you know that line. If you are interested in hearing Mark's first interview, this is his second time on the podcast, you can go to episode 304. He was first on the podcast September 3rd of 2021, so it's been just about two, well, just a little over two years since he was last on the podcast. Um, So if you want to listen to that interview, you can certainly go back to episode 304 and listen to that before or after you listen to this one. So let me give you the description of the book. Again, Yippie Kaye, mother, however you want to say that second part. That line, one of the many quotable moments from Die Hard, was an on-the-spot insertion during filming by actor Bruce Willis and director John McTiernan. That's just one of numerous ad-lib or almost accidental elements added to the film, which make it such a memorable modern classic. 
When Die Hard premiered in July 1988, John McClane didn't just become a fly in Hans Gruber's ointment. He heralded a new era of action movies, inspired countless knockoff action movies, best described as Die Hard in A or Die Hard on A copycats, and created a franchise that spanned five decades, if you include the 2020 Die Hard battery commercial. Even 35 years later, it continues to inspire heated annual debates regarding the film's status as a Christmas movie. This guide, lovingly researched by a die-hard, pun pun completely intended, fan of the 1988 action-adventure blockbuster, collects trivia, behind-the-scenes stories of the movie, the script, the actors, and the books and other written materials that Die Hard and several of the follow-on films in the franchise were based on or inspired by. If you're a fan of Die Hard, then you're going to love Yippie Kaye. Welcome to the party, pal. (laughs) So that is the description of the book that we are talking about. Again, the author is Mark Leslie. And I will say, even though I do not watch Christmas, I mean, Die Hard every year at Christmas, I'm not sure I'm going to, I'm going to, here's my confession. I don't think I've ever seen a Die Hard movie all the way through. I know many, many, many of the one-liners and scenes from the first one because they just come up everywhere and, and there's all those memes that are out at Christmas. I don't. I don't know that I've seen it all the way through. I don't think I have, but I know so much about it. It's such a, I wouldn't call it a cult classic because it's, it's got such wide appeal, but, um, I really enjoyed this book and I really enjoyed talking to Mark about this book. His writing is easy to engage. It's funny. You get a lot of behind the scenes, little trivia facts. If you're a fan of the movie and want to know more, whenever I, I, I read all kinds of things about movies that I've seen a million times, you know, even, even if it's trivia, I already know I'm still going to read an article or a book or something about a movie. And so that might be what this book is for you. If you are one of those people that have seen Die Hard a million times, or you watch it every year at Christmas or what have you, definitely check out this book because it is a lot of fun and you are going to get some of that now. Let's go ahead and start the interview with Mark so he can tell you more about the book. Hi, Mark. Welcome back to the podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. I'm glad to have you back. And it's fun because uh, we were talking about one of your fictional books, one of your werewolf books last time you were on the podcast. But this time we're talking about something different. So I'm excited about that. Before we get to the different, um, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about yourself as a refresher for people who know you or um, to introduce yourself to people who might not know you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I write under the name Mark uh, Leslie and uh, mostly write um, urban fantasy, thrillers, true ghost stories, uh, etc. So this is a, a bit of a departure for me, writing that sort of nonfiction, uh, you know, pop culture trivia with a bit of 80s nostalgia thrown into the mix. Definitely 80s nostalgia. And actually, this is your second book uh related to a movie the the other one relating to planes trains and automobiles also 80s nostalgia which is cool yeah yeah 100 percent. And, and again um it's it's a it's a passion project because you know these are movies i've watched hundreds and hundreds of times over the past several decades absolutely and i think a lot of people who love movies have a handful of movies that they have seen so many times and it doesn't matter how many times they see them if it comes on tv they'll watch it or if there's something new to read you know about it they will read that mm-hmm. so in this no, case yeah. as yeah uh, and th- oh go uh, ahead sorry <laughs> no apologies I, go ahead no th- and that is definitely the case here um th- th- this is um this is basically a movie that i watch at least once a year if not more than once a year and so why not put all of that passion and all of that useless trivia? <laughs> it's a good use. I actually love useless trivia. My brain is full of useless trivia, so I am all for it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. But of course, we are talking about, um, the for the most part, the first Die Hard movie, but the franchise as a whole as well. So the book is called Yippie, Yippie Kaye Mother, <clears throat> Mother Effer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Most people, whether they've seen the movie or not, are going to know that line. Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) uh, They know what we're talking about. Can you just give an overview of the book? Yeah, sure. And and, and it's funny, I I did pick the title specifically because 
I knew that if people heard that, they would know what it was from, even if they hadn't seen the movie. And so, you know, the artwork on the cover, you know, is John McClane in a bloody white shirt. <laughs> uh, so you can kind of, you know, that, that recognizable, which of course was uh, donated to the Smithsonian <laughs> because John McClane, you know, with, with, uh, the, that classic line and, and just the classic scene. So, so Yippie Kaye, Mother Bleeper, a trivia guide to Die Hard is basically, it's just a, a love fest filled with trivia about Die Hard. And it's primarily about the movie Die Hard because that kicked off the franchise. But it does get into some of the background of the other movies, particularly because one of the bits of information, and it kind of opens up as what was the source for, uh, you know, the screenplay that became Die Hard. And, and that, of course, was a novel uh, called Nothing Lasts Forever by Wal- um I was going to say by Walter Weiger. It's not by Walter Weiger. That's the, the sequel is written by... <laughs> by him but this is um broderick thorpe who uh wrote this uh, novel nothing lasts forever and it got readapted into die hard and of course die hard 2 was based on a novel as well a different novel that one by walter weiger and and so uh it was interesting for me as a book nerd when i first found that out uh, when i first found it out i looked up broderick thorpe's book it was out of print i went and purchased a copy i wanted to see the differences and the adaptation, et cetera. And I did the same thing with Die Hard 2, and I read the book it was based on. Nowhere near as good uh, as, as, the, as the first one, but still an intriguing concept that the screenwriters, you know, uh, uh, adapted with John McClane. And then I looked at the source for, well, if I'm looking at those two, let's look at all the other movies. Where did they come from? Who wrote them? And, and stuff like that, because that's something we don't, well, we just recently went through a writer's strike in Hollywood, but we don't really pay attention to who's writing these things. And then I looked at a whole bunch of other trivia things, like the fact that this was the movie. Die Hard was the movie that it wasn't uh, Bruce Willis's first Hollywood movie, but he was previously known as David Addison on Moonlighting with Sybil Shepard, sort of a a romantic comedy, you know, the private detective uh, drama that was on television. And so this was the breakaway hit that turned Bruce Willis into a, a movie star and an action hero. And Die Hard was a movie that set the bar so much higher than any other action film before its time. It raised the bar significantly such that it became, in Hollywood pitch sessions, it became, uh, you know, Die Hard in a, you know, Die Hard on a train, which would have been uh, speed. And, and a lot of, a lot of movie concepts were Die Hard in a or on a or near a. And and that just became a whole new element of Hollywood history when you look at it. Not to mention the phenomenal annual debates that come up around Christmas season that <laughs> are related to the Die Hard movie. So, I mean, I just had so much fun putting as much of that love and energy. And, and of course, all the research, because I've read uh, at least a half dozen books about Die Hard and, 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 and dozens and dozens of articles uh, about it as well and interviews with Bruce Willis and interviews with the screenwriters interviews with the director uh, like so much behind the scenes because again it's not like the movie just came out a couple years ago we've had this movie in our repertoire as movie lovers you know since the uh, 80s and I released it on the 35th anniversary of uh, of the theatrical release of Die Hard. I have comments, lots of comments, but you are going to have to wait for those comments until after the first break of this episode. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome 
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As you know, I am speaking today with Mark Leslie about his behind-the-scene trivia book based on the movie and the franchise Die Hard. Let's return to that interview. A few comments from what you were just saying. One, I loved, loved, loved me some Moonlighting. Used to watch mm. it all the time. Um, we, uh, so yes, I, I love Bruce Willis from that. And then, um, <laughs> I was fascinated by your discussion of the the source material because it's interesting that you have two movies based on two completely different books by off, different authors. Um, so yeah. you're taking very, you know, you're taking this franchise and characters, but basing them on disparate, <laughs> disparate books. So I thought that was really yeah. cool. And also that I is love- genius. Yeah, yeah, that is genius when, when, because again, and then you take the character of John McClane, who's not even the character in the original book. Right. It's a complete like it, the character in the original book, Joe Leland, yeah. is in his late 60s. So they had to say, well, we can't have a guy running around up, up on elevator shafts and up and down the stairs and stuff like that. This guy wouldn't last 15 minutes. Uh, so they had to make a younger character. And, they, and so they recreated it. And in the book, he's there to visit his daughter who works for, you know, like not Nakatomi, but whatever the corporation is in the in the book, as opposed to his wife. And so there's this whole other, you know, subplot of getting back together with his wife that's part of the movie that isn't part of, uh, of that original novel. So I just, I love the genius of when writers can readapt and make something even better. Mm hmm. And the, the age old debate of is it a Christmas movie? I love that because. <laughs> it's not a movie I watch at Christmas. So for me, it's not a Christmas movie, uh, but I completely understand. Like you lay out the arguments beautifully. And honestly, if, if a lot of people know that, that, that title of the book, Yippie Kaye, um, it's because there are, there are memes at Christmas time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That include, yeah. That include that line. But, um, you mentioned that a lot of movies were, you know, die hard on a, a train or die hard here, or die hard there. And do you want to talk a little bit about, the character of John McClane and how he wasn't your typical action hero of the time. He showed vulnerability. He was a little bit different than the Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger characters that were out at the time. Oh yeah. 100%. That's another thing that really raised the bar is seeing an action figure that again, they all have to be a little bit larger than life, but he was vulnerable. He, you know, the, in his, almost his first, his first solo dialogue that he has with his wife and he's hoping to get together with her again because they've separated because he made a stupid boneheaded mistake. And, 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 and some of the first words out of his mouth, he ends up like he's, you see him banging his head on the, on, on the door when she leaves and he's like, way to go, John. You screwed it up again. So you see that vulnerability. You see the vulnerability as he's talking to Al. Howell, the, the cop, who's also vulnerable because, you know, you, you learn that he accidentally shot a kid and that's why he's, you know, and that's why he's riding a desk, not, a, not, um, not out on the beat, uh, anymore. And, and then, and then he even cries when he, when he thinks he's not going to make it and he wants Al, uh, to relay a message to his, to his wife, uh, and apologize for the first time in, in their entire relationship as he realizes I may not make it. So, there's this beautiful vulnerability. And then the other thing, and it did happen in some action films, but the, the comedic moments, not just, not just from John McClane, like the lines, obviously Yippie Kaye and all of the one liners, like no kidding, lady. Did you think I was calling to order a pizza when he's calling 911 and they say it's reserved for emergency, uh, you know, for emergency calls? Like there's so many great one liners, uh, of John McClane and some of, some of which, of course, Bruce Willis came up with on the spot, such as, uh, such as the joke about now I know what a TV dinner feels like. Or, or I think that the, the line that they even end up using in the trailer, come on out to the coast. We'll get together, have a few laughs as he's crawling through the tunnel, uh, call, call, crawling through the, uh, the air vent. Um, so, and not only do you have those memorable lines, but you also have in the bad guy in, in Hans Gruber. And again, Alan Rickman's first, um, major film role. You have a bad guy who you know is bad, but he is just so eloquent and well spoken and and darkly humorous like there's a lot of dark humor that comes from the interactions with gruber and and his uh, goons as well and 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 again, there's something you 
you like about the character, even though he's a bad guy and, 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 you know, he should, he does meet his just rewards because it's not, it's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls off Nakatomi Tower. But, um, there's just so many of those elements of, of the main protagonist and the main antagonist. And, and even the scene, even the scene where the two of them meet one another in the movie was, uh, something that was not in, not in the novelization. Uh, version, but they realize you have to have the main good guy and the main bad guy actually interact with one another in person. Uh, and that was really, uh, an important element where, where they're both on the screen and the tension is just ratcheted because, you know, John's pretending to, to, um, have wandered up to the roof or, or whatever. And, and so Alan Rickman's character is pretending to be one of the hostages who got away. And, and there's just this beautiful interplay between those two characters. Because, of course, yeah, you get the very end. There's the the showdown between the two of them. But it's great to see them engaging not just in the in the radio conversation that they have throughout the movie, but they actually get to interact in person very briefly. So you get to see you get to see both actors and you get to see the writers really nail that kind of scene. I love Alan Rickman as an actor so much. I mean, even when he is, cause he often plays a bad guy. I mean, obviously Snape, yeah. he's the, the sheriff of Nottingham and the Robin Hood yeah. movie. He, he's not a good guy in love actually. And yet I'm still like, I just love you so much. I know. I he's you, the bad guy love you love. You. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, You've touched on this a little bit, but how much research did you actually do going into the writing? Oh man. I mean, I knew I was going to do the book about a year before, um, it came out. And so, I mean, I had been researching it my whole life, <laughs> but I ended up purchasing, uh, I, I have different VHS and DVD and Blu-ray versions of the movie, multiple versions with different special features, went back and rewatched them because I've already watched most of them, watched several specials about the making of Die Hard, including like shows like the Netflix is the movies that made us, which is a really great um, summary. Purchased a whole bunch of books, including a beautiful giant coffee table, beautifully uh, with lots of photos in it um, uh, that just gets into the details and the background and interviews with so many of the people involved. And and so it was it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, sitting there watching the movie and making notes because, again, I'd find a bit of research that said, OK, there's a blooper here or there's a, a whatever that's going on. I need to verify it and and like even put the timestamp in it and stuff like that for the movie. So I could go in and double check and make sure that it's actually true or accurate. Or even as I'm just describing things or watching the special features, sitting there in front of the, in front of the, and, and I, I usually do that on a TV so I can be sitting there comfortably with the remote control and rewind and fast forward, rewind and play it again, play it again, play it again, watch, watch the same scene a half dozen times in about 15 minutes. It was a lot of work and it was, I can't even count the hours of research that I put into it. And then taking all those notes and trying to figure out how am I going to break this down? So when I want to talk about, you know, this element, do I talk about it as part of its own chapter where I talk about why we love John McClane? Um, or do I want to just put that into the the miscellaneous chapter that's just sort of those uh, bullet points of of trivia and say, well, I'm not really sure where else to put this, so I'm going to stick it in here. And so a lot of times in the writing of the book, I had this, the bullet points were this massive, it just went on forever. And then as I extracted elements from the bullet points, I deleted them out of that chapter and then added them to the other ones. But I even wanted to try to name the chapters things that were related to the movie. So if somebody sees the the chapter called an exceptional thief, someone who knows the movie really, really well knows it's a brilliant um, line or a exchange between Bonnie uh, Bedelia's character and uh, or Holly McLean's character and Alan Rickman's character in Hans Gruber, where she says, after all this posturing and all those speeches, you're nothing but a common thief. And he turns to her, gets right in her face and says, I am an exceptional thief. So, you know, obviously that that chapter is going to be about the character Hans Gruber. And, and of course, uh, you know, the beloved uh, Alan Rickman as well. Sure. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I imagine you have 
a lot of research that you did not use for the book? How difficult was that to sift through it and decide what to use and what not? Yeah, it's kind of hard because sometimes there's bits of trivia that I picked up and I and I read somewhere. Um, like IMDB or whatever, there's all these like one liners of bits of trivia. I usually wanted to cross reference it with trivia from another place. And so if I wasn't able to have read the, the bit of information in multiple places, I maybe didn't include it in the book. Cause again, I don't want to shortchange the reader. I want the reader to feel confident that I didn't just grab, Oh, someone randomly said this thing and, and I'm just going <clears> to <throat> take it as gospel. I wanted to make sure it was at least well researched. So there's probably probably five to ten thousand words from the first draft that either didn't work, you know, in going through uh, you know the editing phases uh, with the book, they didn't work. So my editor either suggested I take them out, or I decided to take it out and maybe you know replace five hundred words here with oh that can just be like a uh, hundred words in a bullet point. It doesn't need to be three paragraphs in a chapter. Uh, so there's a lot of that editing, but what I wanted it to be was as complete a possible a look at various elements of again, why do we love Die Hard? Why is why is it lasted so long? Why do people continue to refer to it? And and why are are, are so many writers and filmmakers? Uh, why do they often call back to it uh, and and say like this inspired me in in some way? So. So yeah, again, I wanted it to be complete, but I didn't want it to be too exhaustive. Um, and, and I do, I did find myself repeating myself a couple times because sometimes in the introduction, I mentioned something, but I get into it in more detail in the later chapter or something is a bullet point in, in the general trivia section. But I, again, I get into a little bit more detail. So, um, I, I tried to remove as many of those redundancies as possible, but sometimes it makes, it makes sense, uh, to include them in, in, in a different way. In, in a different part of the book. But that's part of the fun, I think, of when it all finally comes together when, you know, when you're when you're going through that second or third or fourth draft of the book. Time for our second break of this episode. When we come back, we'll be talking more about, of course, the movie Die Hard, the book about the movie Die Hard, behind the scenes trivia about Die Hard, all of that fun stuff we've already been talking about, but there's more to come. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with author Mark Leslie. Yeah, and you mentioned IMDb. Um, It cracks me up that when you go to IMDb to look at the movie, the trailer on there is actually the reworked trailer that makes it a Christmas movie. Oh, yeah, which is which is which is really, really funny. Now, speaking of trailers, one of the bits of trivia that I thought was hilarious, because, you know, you and I both loved... um, uh, David Addison, Moonlighting, Bruce Willis was hilarious, just genius in that role. When they aired the trailer initially, uh, in theaters, they had this suspenseful thing and it's Christmas Eve and these people are breaking in. And then, you know, like 30 seconds or 45 seconds into the trailer, there's a close up of, of John McClane with the gun. And it's a close up of his face as he's looking around the corner to see what's going on. And he looks shocked and everything. And because we were so used to laughing at everything that 
Bruce Willis did on Moonlighting, the audience burst into laughter. They thought it was supposed to be funny. And so what they did is they removed Bruce Willis's face from the movie posters and they removed him from the initial trailers. It wasn't until the movie launched and it was a huge blockbuster and already making millions of dollars in the first weekend that they put him back <laughs> because, because that initial reaction was, Oh, this is going to be a funny movie. Um, and, and of course it, it did have humorous moments, but it's so interesting, uh, when you look at the trailers and even looking historically at some of the movie posters and you see, oh, it's just the building. And then, and then you see the, that half, um, half of Bruce Willis's face kind of like beside the building, like sort of looking, uh, looking anxious. Uh, I love those little bits, uh, that you, you learn about this movie after the fact, right? Now, it's hard for us to think about that now because we've seen Bruce Willis in so many different roles over the years, but back in the day, he was David Addison. He was the, he was the comic relief in Moonlighting. Yeah. And, and just, just think about it. If you're Bruce Willis and this is your first really big Hollywood movie and they've, they just take you off all of the posters. I know. Oh my God. Yeah. But, but, but he, he proved, he proved a lot of things Absolutely. with that film. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously there's, there's other books of this type out there. You mentioned a couple that you bought and referenced. Um, what do you hope people w might take away from, from your book specifically? I, I just want them to walk away with an appreciation for so many of those elements that we may not think about. We may look back and say, yeah, Die Hard, cool movie, love it, watch it every year. You know, we'd love to debate if, whether or not it's a Christmas film. It's a thing we always get in fights at over Christmas, uh, Christmas dinner with the family or whatever. I want them to walk away with a bit more of an appreciation for all of those elements of so many different people who put such brilliant, uh, their brilliant talent and skill and efforts into making something that we can truly appreciate it. Maybe that's the writer in me just wanting, wanting to properly acknowledge the, all of the people, right? Like just from, from costume and design and soundtrack and screenwriters and directors and assistants, everyone who had anything to do uh, with a movie like Die Hard, I want people to walk away with more of an appreciation for just how beautiful it is that we can have this two hour experience based on countless hours of, of, of really hard work by so many talented people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you watch it with your son every year once he got old enough. Um, so what does yeah. he think of the fact that A, you wrote a book and what does he think of the book? Well, you know what? He was, this was the first book of mine, uh, that I've been working on. He's 19 now. It was the first book of mine that, uh, I've worked on that he actually asked me about as I was working on it. He didn't know I was going to dedicate the book to him. So I surprised him by having a copy drop shipped, uh, to, to him when, uh, when it arrived. Uh, he lives, uh, in a different city now. He's going to college. And it was so wonderful for him, not only because in, in my previous uh, book, uh, The Canadian Mounted, about planes, trains, and automobiles, there's a picture of the two of us. We got stranded on a highway, and that was another movie we, we watch every year. And and there's a picture of us saying, yeah, and we, we actually had some fun making a, a shot that we tried to look like Steve Martin and John Candy while we were str stranded on the side of the highway. And so he was so thrilled. Uh, not only, uh, you know, to have the book dedicated to him, but it was, he was so thrilled to, to, to learn things because some of these trivia bits I'd been telling him, even in the last year when we were watching it together at Christmas time, as we often do. But then there were other elements that, you know, I never shared with him because again, I don't want to bore people to death when I'm watching a movie. And that's a big challenge I have is not, is like, Mark, shut up and just enjoy the movie. People who are sitting in the room with you don't want to hear you say, oh, and in this scene, there's this thing that happens, right? So um, he was, he was just, I think he was, I think he was pretty excited about this one. This is, like I said, this is the first book of mine that he was pretty actively excited about, even knowing I was working on it. Um, so that, that was, that was a cool thing uh, for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. This is the second book that you've written about a movie that you love. Um, so what is it? Obviously you write fiction as well, but what is it about writing 
maybe more trivia based about movies that you love that draws you into that writing? You know, I mean, uh, the other nonfiction books I, I have, I mean, there's some for writers, but then uh, the ones that I've written are true ghost stories that involves a lot of research. And, and I guess I've, I've already know how to do research and I know how to pull details together and, and tell a compelling story. But this act that I kind of accidentally fell into of doing research on something I really love already and already know really, really well, and then trying to bring that love and passion and all that information into something that I think will be entertaining and informative uh, for others. There is something really magically special about that that is unlike any of the other books I've worked on only because and I think this is and this is true for uh, for the Canadian Mounted and and for Yippie Kaye is that I was expecting a very small percentage of people to get it the way I got it to go oh cool and and want it and want to buy it and want to read it I was actually shocked when I found out how many nerds like me there actually were <laughs> who would actually purchase it um and so when when the canadian mounted took off and sold like crazy i thought wow that's surprising i would have still been happy just putting the book out just making it available for you know 30 other people who might feel as passionate about the movie as i do but obviously there's a lot more and the same thing for die hard and that's why i already have a list of other movies that I know I'm, I've already started the work on, uh, because the, uh, the act of putting these together is satisfying, but then it's also satisfying to know that there's other people out there that just love it and seem to enjoy it as much as I do. And, and that is one of the most amazing feelings in the world. Mm, fun. Yeah, absolutely. What are you currently working on? Well, I am uh, working on right now a book that's going to be called Merry Christmas. The other word for uh, crapper is full, um, which is a line that Cousin Eddie uh -huh. says. And Christmas, yeah, so you recognized it. Yeah. Um, the Christmas Vacation, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So in 2024, that movie will be 35 years old. <laughs> and so... I am, uh, you know, dug into, you know, like the original short story published in National Lampoon that John uh, Hughes wrote that he readapted in the screenplay. There's so much information, so much trivia uh, about that movie. So many interviews with uh, with the actors uh, who were in it. Now, obviously, you know, John Hughes, uh, again, also the director of Planes, Trains and Automobiles is no longer with us, but uh, there are great interviews with him in research. So that will be coming out probably in time for Christmas next year. Perfect. And another cult classic that lots and lots of people I'm sure don't consider Christmas without watching that one. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's so many other, I mean, I already have a list of, 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 of what, what's next. <laughs> what are the other movies from most likely the eighties uh, yeah. that I'm going to be doing this with? And again, I look at it and go, Oh, this research is going to be a lot of fun. Sure. Well, yeah, especially when it's a movie that you love. Makes sense. Yeah. And then um, do you want to talk a little bit more about your werewolf books, a little bit about that series? Yeah. So that, again, that's another thing that kind of caught me by surprise. It started off as a 10,000 word short story. Uh, a buddy of mine convinced me to turn it into a novel. It took me 10 years to finish the first draft of it and I was done. I published it in 2016 kind of, you know, chopped my hands together and said, okay, good. Now, what else am I going to work on? And then in 20, well, prior to 2020, I did have an editor ask for, um, um, for Amazing Monster Tales wanted a story, Monster Road Trip. And I was like, oh, maybe if I, what if I return to that character and put him, stick him on a train and have him heading to Stowe, Vermont for Manhattan, but he's going to turn into a wolf before he gets there. And what, what if, what if there's someone else on the train that he's trying to protect um, from a human predator? Wouldn't that be cool? So I started writing the story and the editors, when I told them what I was going to write, they said, there's no way that's only going to be a 5,000 word story. And they were right. My first draft of that was 24,000 words. I think we cut it down to 18,000. And then I realized that's a novella um, featuring the main character. And so in 2020, I re-released a Canadian werewolf in New York with a new cover. They're actually branded as urban fantasy. 
and I did the the second book, the follow up novella, Stowaway. And that very same year, I'd already started. Well, I had started working on uh, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles uh, as the next full length book in the series. And then suddenly, I realized, oh no, I have way more Michael Andrews tales. And so, you know, book seven is coming out in March of 2024, and that's going to be called only monsters in the building. And and I've been having so much fun with that series. Appropriate considering the popularity of th- that, <laughs> that show. Yeah. I love yeah, it. And it's got a riff on, it's got a riff on a uh, title that sounds somewhat familiar, right? So that's, that's the yeah. pattern is a Canadian werewolf in New York, fear and longing in Los Angeles, yeah. fright nights, big city, hex in the city, you know, so a lot of the titles are, <laughs> Uh, sounds somewhat familiar, but, but that's the play. Uh, so hopefully readers understand that there's going to be some humor and action involved in this series. More about Mark's werewolf series. When we come back, let's go ahead and take that final break of this episode. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC book review podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my conversation with Mark Leslie. I love that this the, this werewolf character that you just wrote a, a, a short story about kind of, it just kind of not took over your life, but made a very big impression into your life. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that, that was a wonderful surprise when I realized I'm not done telling Michael Andrews stories. <laughs> Um, and even, and, and so the coolest thing is, is my co-author, Julie Strauss, because I wanted to tell the love backstory between two of the main characters. And so I had Julie write, um, Gail's perspective of the, the backstory to when they very first met and fell in love all those years ago. She enjoyed it so much that I had her co-author Hex in the City with me because I needed that to be told from both Michael and Gail's point of view. And then she liked Gail so much that she's writing a spinoff trilogy of Gail off on her own adventures. And so, I mean, it's really grown in a way I never would have imagined when I first wrote a short story that said, what might happen if a guy who turned into a wolf once a month lived in a big city like New York? And I asked the question, well, where would he find clothes? Where would he run around when he woke up? Where would he find clothes like to, to go back and uh, to get back home? And, and, and it was kind of like these humorous thoughts I had about the side effects and that that was just meant to be a short story, and suddenly this whole universe has grown out of it. That I that has kind of surprised me in a in a really entertaining way over the years. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I like that. How about when you take time to read just for you? You're not doing research or anything else. What have you been reading? I I read across the board, so I read so many different books. I just finished. Emily uh, St. John Mandel's uh, latest novel. Um, um, Of course, I'm drawing a blank on the, on the title. It's, um, uh, it's like a science fiction time travel adventure. It's named after a place on the moon. Why, why can't I, why can't I think of the title? Uh, I should probably know it too, but it's not um, coming to me. But anyway, so I just finished that, just finished a Linwood Barkley uh, thriller uh, called The Lie Maker uh, Terry Follis's, uh, um, more literary, uh, title, A New Season. I'm reading a nonfiction book, uh, right now, uh, that is, of course, I'm drawing a blank on, on that, um, nonfiction book about being more open minded and, and being willing to change your mind about things. Uh, Adam Grant's Think Again. And, and of course, um, just, just finished, of course, proofreading for the millionth time. 
another book I'm publishing under my own imprint uh, called How to Write a Howling Good Story by Wolf Moon, which is uh, for writers. And that's coming out uh, in, in, in a few weeks. And of course, I'm also publishing the 25th an- anniversary of Edo Van Belkom's Death Drives a Semi, a beautiful horror collection that is uh, my version of, of The October Country by Ray Bradbury. Uh, when I read this book 25 years ago, it was life-changing for me. And I've read that so many times. And as a bookseller, I sold it to so many people. And it's been out of print. So I'm so happy to be bringing that back. So I obviously just finished reading many proofreads of that. So I, I've always got numerous books on the go. Um, I can't not be reading all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, sea of Tranquility. I- Thank you. Sea of Tranquility. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Because otherwise, uh, if, you're, if your brain's anything like mine, it would have bugged you. <laughs> so. mm-hmm. Thank you. And I think it's on the, it's still on the nightstand in the other room, which is why I was, I was looking around for it. And it's yes. like, well, no, it's not filed under, under M on my bookshelf behind me. So <laughs> obviously it's in another room somewhere still. And that's the only place name on the moon I could think of. So, but I was, but that, that turns out to be correct. So. <laughs> there you um, go. In terms of internet presence, uh, website and any social media that people can find you on in case they want to learn more. Yeah, of course. You can find me at marklesley.ca and there's links to all my social media there. You'll find that a lot of my social media, I share a lot of pictures of skeletons and, and the decor that I have in you know, Halloween this time of year. But Barnaby Bones, my companion who comes with me, or or just really bad dad jokes, which is usually what you'll find me doing on TikTok because I just can't resist making people's eyes roll. Well, we've been warned. <laughs> There's some really good dad jokes out there, though. I mean, they're... So, I mean, and when I say good, I mean obviously bad. They're so bad. Good they're bad good. jokes. Yeah, yeah. Good bad dad jokes. Yeah. Exactly. I, I keep them in a database so um, I have uh, easy access to them. <laughs> of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you would want to bring up at this point that we have not covered in our time together? No, no. I just uh, think that if people are curious to check me out, there's plenty of free material available online in audiobook format, ebook format as well. So if you're curious to check my stuff out, there's a lot of free stuff. And if you want to see me parodying John McClain, uh, like I do on the back cover of the, of the book, um, you can find those pictures on, on my Instagram and even uh, TikTok accounts as well. Yeah. Your author and your author photo is a little bit, um, eschatological in that you are the diehard the first diehard but you are bald like bruce willis is in later <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was trying to capture and then of course i i wasn't willing to shave my beard off for the pictures but i did everything i could to try to look like him including going out and buying a, a bb gun beretta that looked very similar to the model he uses in Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me about this book in particular, but um, writing in general and your other books as well. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sarah. Always a pleasure. Thank you once again to Mark for taking the time to speak to me about this book and the movie and the franchise behind it that he clearly loves so much. It's so much fun to talk to somebody. Um, I love movies and I love people who love movies and, and get kind of geek out about them and love all the behind the scenes trivia that's definitely right up my alley yesterday was my dad's birthday and one of the things that we always did together was watch movies and we would watch the same movies over and over and over again and it was just it was it was our thing we would quote movies he didn't quote them as much as my brother and I do my brother and I can send each other entire text conversations that are nothing but movie quotes but we got that love of movies from our dad. And so I definitely was thinking about him yesterday on his birthday and missing him and wishing I could sit down and watch a movie with him. So thank you, Mark, for sharing your love of this movie and um, the fact that you watch it with your son, etc. cetera. I, I just love all of that. It's just fun to talk to authors who are so excited about what they have written and, you know, pretty much all of my my authors are and I love getting to chat with them about their work. I love getting to hang out with you sort of every week. Uh, thank you for being listeners and for following the podcast. You are appreciated more than you can possibly know. I hope that you will join me next week for the next interview. I will be speaking with author Annie Rains about her book Through the Snow Globe. It is a it's set at Christmas time. 
So put on, I know, I know it's only October, but if you're going to buy holiday books, you have to start thinking about it now, right? We'll go right back to spooky season after we talk about this book. I promise I'm not shoving Christmas down your throats yet because I love Halloween. I love spooky season. I love October for all of that. But very excited to talk to Annie about this book. So I hope you will join me for that interview in the meantime. If you are indeed a fan of this podcast, you know what's coming next. There are a few things you can do to help me get this podcast out to more listeners such as yourselves. You can like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you listen to the podcast on. This helps us so much and it's so very appreciated. It also helps you to know when there are new episodes. You can leave a review. Written, starred, either way, can be a one sentence review. Whatever you're in the mood for, it helps to get this podcast out to more listeners. And then, of course, there's social media. If you are on social media and you want to follow the podcast, you can do that on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. Love hearing from you. Come find the podcast. Let me know. Ooh, let me know what you're reading in October for spooky season. Do you like creepy, gory, icky, hello, see, icky, that was, that was pejorative, right? Um, I'm more of a cute, fun, cozy mystery Halloween sort of person, so, uh, but I know lots of people love horror, so tell me what you're reading for spooky season. Is it scary? Is it cute? Is it a combination of scary and cute? I don't know. Let me know. I'm always looking for new things to read during the month of October. I hope you're having a great week. And I hope that whatever this week brings you, it's going to give you many, many times to get lost in many, many good books. Thanks so much. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.